Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events tonight. And uh, we're really pleased to have our good friend Alice Hoffman here with us, albeit virtually, um, to discuss her brand new book, The Book of Magic, which is the, what's the, the term, tetralogy? Yep. Yes, that started, of course, with this book, Practical Magic. And um, we, uh, I think they've already shipped copies to Alice of the Book of Magic, and we'll be getting a bunch of signed ones. And I'll put a link in the comments field. And there's some cool swag that goes with these signed copies too, one of which is the silk key, and then some other items. So I'll go ahead and put a, a link in the comments field should you like to order a copy. And I'll also be monitoring that. So if you have questions for Alice, just go ahead and put them in as they occur to you throughout the hour. And I'll be summoned back by Barbara at some point to ask your questions. So anyway, over to you, Barbara. Thank you, Patrick. It's a practical magic, right? I get to, <laughs> Patrick blacks out and then we bring him <laughs> back in. So Alice, the toast to you. What a real pleasure it is to see you again. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to see you. Thank you both. I really appreciate you inviting me here. Well, it's our pleasure. And we do thank you for signing books for us because I do think that your fans really appreciate that continuing personal connection since you can't be here. Um, at least, you know, it, it touches on it. So, you know, I think every event you do with every entity should have a few things that are special just to this entity. So I have one for you. Um, wait, I, I'm sorry, I put it on my phone. I have to, I have to do it this way. But Alice, we had um, a wonderful staff member who was crazy about Practical Magic. She sold a copy of Practical Magic to everybody. And she's been gone for a while, but all of a sudden we heard, um, and we did an event for her that uh, under the name Laurel Woodward, she has written a book and a kind of tribute to you called Kitchen Witchery, which has had great reviews. And uh, what it says at the outset is that Woodward shares the magic of everyday things, revealing how each task can become a ritual of creation through cooking. And I thought that is such a nice tribute to you because that's really what it is. Well, that's so nice and congratulations to her. That's awesome that she did that. You know, there is a lot of cooking and uh, in kitchen work in, in my books too. I've realized that because people keep asking me for the recipes for certain um, dishes that are served in my book. So that sounds like a great idea to have kitchen witchery. I think so too. And, you know, I love the idea that it it's becomes an act of magic. And really, if you think about it, kitchen, you know, cooking is chemistry and, and it really stems from alchemy. So, I mean, you know, people, people really have come to understand what leavening agents actually mean. But before they just knew if they put something in the recipe and they baked it. <laughs> magic. <got> it's <laughs> magic. Yeah. Bread rises magically. And Alice and I were talking right before we started about how long ago our relationship goes. It's at least 10 years. And I was saying to her that I don't think it was the first book that we did together, but The Duck Keepers, one of her um, wonderful novels, I absolutely loved it. And, and it, it, it took me back to reading James Mishner's The Source, which was a book I truly dove into because I really didn't know anything about that Jewish history. I didn't know anything about Masada um, and so forth. I'm now married to, I have a wonderful Jewish husband, but when I read the source, I didn't, I wasn't, and I didn't know any of this. And I think The Dove Keepers is such a meaningful book, Alice, because it really tells the women's stories. You tend to think, and Mishnu did, really was focused on the men. What interested you, before we talk about this, I've been dying to ask you this, what really yeah. interested you in The Dove Keepers? You know, I also knew nothing about Jewish history, even though I'm Jewish. I had never read the source, but I have family in Israel and I have a son who's an archeologist. And so I happened to meet him over in Israel. I was visiting my family and we decided to go to Masada. Um, I knew this, basically the story, it was this stronghold where, where um, Jews kind of held out against the Romans uh, for quite a long time when Jerusalem was being destroyed and the Jews were being murdered by the Romans. But, you know, we went and it was, it's, a, it was, it's a very kind of spiritual place and I, it's a very, in some ways, magical place. And I felt like this, the kind of the spirit of the women who had been there. And then as we were leaving, I saw a sign that said there had been survivors. And as soon as I saw that sign, I felt like this is a novel. 
because I'm very interested in survivorship of all kinds. I'm a breast cancer survivor. I have written about the Holocaust. I'm interested in the way people manage to survive, which is always so astounding to me that they do manage to do so. So I, I started researching it and I started writing it. If I had known how much work it would be, I felt like I could have really spent my whole life studying that time period. But instead, it took it took about five years to, to do that book. And I, I realized I could never know everything. I just had to know what my characters knew. And um, it was a real, for me, it was an incredible experience writing that book and then going back to Masada and after the book was was written and feeling like I was kind of part of the family there, it was it was a really wonderful experience for me. And it comes across in the book. I mean, it's a truly magical book. Um, one of the things that happens when we have all these um, wonderful Zoom events is that people who watch them are so interested in reading recommendations, maybe because under Zoom, under COVID, we've had more time to read. So I can recommend if you've never read it, read the source and then read the Dove Keepers. But I brought that up in part because one of the great things about this book um, is that at least in the advanced reading copy, I'm handicapped by not having a finished book here, is that Alice um, lists um, a number of books that really have informed and inspired her. And the story starts and it ends in a library, which of course is the pantry portal to books. So Alice, um, is, the, is this list of books, does it appear in the finished copy? It does appear in the finished copy. And it's really, you know, it's kind of, for me, it's the book of magic, but it's very much about libraries and about books. And so threaded through the story are many of the books that have really influenced me and books that I just love. And it's a very eclectic group of books, but I, I list it in the back. And there are other books as well, but the, the list that I discuss in, in this book, but it's all, I think it's all about how, you know, really books are magic and that um, reading and writing and literature is kind of the original magic as far as I'm concerned, words are magic. And, um, and it was really fun making this list and deciding what books to, you know, to put in there and the books that really mattered to me. You know, it's hard when you do that. The exclusionary part is really tough. I mean, it's not that hard to add books, but it's very hard to winnow it down to, you know, we try at the end of the year to come up with like 10 books each, you know, that each of us at the Poison Pen Light, and it's yeah. a horrible task. Um, I don't do it because I figure I'm toast. You know, if I, if I leave out anybody, it would just be fatal. But anyway, one, one of the great things about this book is that even if you've not read the previous three books, if you're a person looking for reading recommendations, Alice is right there for you. And I mean, it's just wonderful. We have things like The Odyssey and The Scarlet Letter and uh, Fahrenheit 451 and The Wild Sargasso Sea and Little Women. I mean, it's, um, as Alice says, eclectic. So it libraries, is. you know, Alice, you struck a real chord. I'm a professional librarian and I realized we have four librarians, former librarians on staff at the Poison Pen. I didn't you know that? Started. Yeah. That's yeah. very um, nice. I, um, I spent my library career, A, when I was getting my master's degree in library sciences, what it used to be called, now it's information science, um, in a university library working. And then um, I spent my library time at the Library of Congress, which was, you know, really oh, fabulous. I'm so impressed. I had no, I had no idea. Oh, well, no, I didn't say it to impress you. Um, but you it was, did. <laughs> but you did it was a wonderful me. experience. Um, and, well, I'll tell you some other time about all the connections we have. Let me just say that you'll like this, that the Library of Congress turned out to be the Yenta in my marriage to my wonderful husband, which is coming up on 31 years, it's a very long story. But anyway, so, you know, we're all drawn to, to the kind of thing that you do in this book, which is to be in your story and a library and, and bring books into it. But the other thing I think is, is really amazing about this book, Alice, is um, how to look at, at, when you know the death is coming for you, when the death watch beetle starts clacking and you know you have seven days, how it is you look at the life you led and how it is you look at the time remaining. I thought it was, you know, and I have to tell you this since I'm 80 years old, it really resonated with me in a way that maybe a younger reader is gonna go, really? Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm not giving anything away because the book starts out in the very first paragraph yeah. saying that one of the major characters, Jet Owens, uh, realizes that she has seven days to live and she has to decide it's just kind of part of the book. It's the first part. 
what she's going to do in the seven days. When she does pass away, uh, kind of everything is affected by, by, her, by her death. Um, but she has to decide how she's going to spend those, those seven days and what matters to her the most. Mm-hmm. And some, some of the things are just very simple things of, you know, being with certain people, working in the garden, cleaning her house, um, being in the library. And, um, and I think, you know, for me, it was like a way to kind of think about these matters myself. You know, what would I do if I had seven days? It, absolutely. But one of the phrases you use over and over again, when she's thinking about her approaching death and the life she's led. And then her sister Franny um, eventually has to make some similar thoughts. And you keep saying, oh, beautiful day over and over again. You know, you're, you're yeah. celebrating the magic of the moment. And, you know, um, it's a very, very hopeful, um, I think, way to, to navigate this difficult journey. Well, you know, it's so interesting that you say that because I think one of the things for me was that I'm trying to figure that out for myself. You know, how do you make every day count and every day matter, especially now during this time during COVID, I think it's really important. I think a lot of us have been thinking about that, you know, every day matters, every day counts. And sometimes, you know, in our busy lives, you know, we just forget about that and let kind of the little details annoy us or get in our way. And I try, often fail, but I try to remember that every day. I know that when I was in treatment for cancer, I think I was able to to do that. It's almost like knowing you have seven days in a way, you know that you're ill. And and I think I was able to, when I was in treatment for breast cancer, to think every day, I'm going to make this day in almost into a whole life. Yeah, well, I went through, um, I actually did die when I was in my very early 40s. And then when I didn't, I want to very large medical malpractice case um, in which um, I probably the largest verdict of its time for somebody who didn't die, uh, which is one reason we had the poison pen. Um, It derailed my life in in a remarkable way. But the thing is, Alice, that because it was a medical thing, um, they induce amnesia when you are in that kind of shape in, in an intensive care unit for a long time. They purposely drug you so you don't experience it because it's too traumatic. You couldn't survive the intrusiveness of it. And what I what I found so interesting about Jet and then later with Franny is that, you know, they they can sort of let the whole world fall away and think about the things that they care about, you know, the people that they love and and the things in their life that um that really matter to them. And now that's a real gift. I mean, you know, if you die in a car wreck or, you know, if something happens and you die unexpectedly, you never have that opportunity to really, you know, look at your life and process it. So I I love the idea that you gave seven days. That's part of the curse, right? It is, it is. You know, I mean, the curse for the Owens really is something that's gone through all the four books and the curse is really begun by Maria Owens in Magic Lessons which takes place in the 17th century. And the curse is she is so wounded in love that she puts a curse. She thinks she's helping her family. She puts a curse on the Owens family that, you know, to to protect them from heartbreak, that they can't fall in love. And if they do fall in love, then the person they fall in love with will meet with a terrible fate. And so the book is kind of like an exploration of how do you break a family curse? You know, and we all have family curses and, you know, in a way, right, what we inherit, you know, kind of psychologically from our parents, grandparents, great grandparents. And, you know, can we come to terms with the past and go forward into the future? And that's really what the book's about. Well, it's also about, you know, what do we do to protect people we love? I mean, if you if you're going to, you know, fall in love with someone and you know that that may be a death sentence and in fact has been. Um, a death sentence to some people. Yeah. Um, what does what does that do? Yeah, I think when you love someone, I mean, certainly when you have a child, you 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 suddenly have the sense that when you love someone or love in any of its form, it's dangerous because you have something to lose, and so that in and of itself is dangerous. But is it you know is this curse? Does it only apply to romantic partners? Because if Jet and Franny take in these two little girls when yeah. their parents are killed and they're only four years old and they yeah. come to live with them. Um, so the curse is not about loving 
children, is it? It's really yeah. about romantic partners. It is. It's about romantic partners. Yeah. Which, of course, yeah. might prevent you from having children. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. Not there. Right. So, um, so the original curse goes back to, because it was, um, we go back to what? Essex, which is a place that witches are, I mean, there's a whole thing in, in English folklore and English history and all where Essex is like an epicenter of witchery and the witch that's finder. Right. The, the, it, the, the witch finder general was there. Yes, yeah. that's right. And, and, um, and, Ironically enough, you know, Essex County in Massachusetts is where Salem is, where kind of the epicenter of American abuse of women as, as you know, supposed witches. So it's interesting that it's Essex and Essex. And it, it, in, in the Book of Magic, the family goes back to the original Essex to try to kind of uncover um, what the curse is all about and how, how do you really break it and, and just kind of uncover their whole family history. Well, you know, the whole the whole witch trials thing, the whole thing, it's really incredibly misogynistic. I mean, you know, there is this sort of male equivalent called warlocks, but you never hear about the warlock hunter, you know, it's yeah. only the witch hunter. Um, and so I think a lot of it was bound up in, A, they didn't understand the kind of medicine that women, you know, who were trained in it could, could do. Yeah, a lot of it had to do with midwives and and with women who used herbal remedies. And it was really interesting to me in my research to discover that in the 17th century in Essex, England, it was right after the Black Death and the plague and that midwives and kind of rustic women healers had more success with their patients than physicians did because they washed their hands. Right. And which is so interesting considering what we've just been going through. And that the Owens women have throughout the books, there's this black soap that they make that supposedly makes them look younger. But originally, the black soap was antibacterial so that they could wash their hands and not infect people they were treating. You know, I read in something, I mean, one of the great things about reading crime fiction forever is you learn this astonishing ragbag of stuff that you just never actually pursue. But in some historical mystery that I ran across or might even been a work of history, childbirth fever, childbed fever was a terrible thing that happened to women. And it stopped at the end of the 19th, or early 20th century when people began to wash their hands, the midwives and the physicians, because they would go from one birth to another and never ever consider, you know, washing up. So right. they would, you know, transmit germs from one woman, one baby to another. And mm -hmm. people died from it. I mean, there was no real concept of bacteriology, germs, or infection, no. was there? No. And it's interesting also that, you know, so many herbal remedies, you know, are now being discovered to actually have, you know, scientific merit so that they were using plants, a kind of green magic um, to heal people. And it was considered, you know, witchcraft rather than leeches or whatever, you know, whatever other horrible things the doctors were doing. Yeah, well, or bleeding. I mean, there were just yes, so many right. things that, you know, if you go back to what was, um, I'm trying to remember the, the huge, um, an instance of the finger post, you know, Ian Paris's enormous bestseller, which was, you know, I, I think it was, can't remember which English doctor it was, was the first one to sort of really try to deal with blood, I think it was blood and blood circulation, maybe the 17th century. I mean, it was a, it was an enormous commercial success for a book like that, you know, you'd, you'd think that people, <laughs> right, people learned a lot um, from it. And, and, and part of the other problem too is that the trials that they put people through, what led up to them could really make normal people crazy. Yeah, well, a lot of times it was, you know, it was women who had property or women who were, were unmarried or, you know, women, I, I think one of the things I found out which really surprised me was that, in the 17th century in England, something 96 or 97% of women were illiterate so that they didn't have power. They didn't have the power of words, of reading and writing and how important reading and writing is. Um, not and, and how kind of magical it is because it gives you power. Well, you do wonder if some of the confessions, and so it's an experiment, I have to tell you, many years ago, I was in Lancashire, which is, next to Essex might have been the place that there was the most of all this witch stuff going on. And they had a set of dungeons in Lancashire Castle. Mm -hmm. And that was where they would imprison the women who uh, were going to be tried 
for witchcraft in and hope that they would confess and be executed and all. And so they had a deal where if you were brave enough, you could be locked up for two minutes in the dungeons at Lancashire Castle oh, to gosh, see what it was like. It? <laughs> did you I did. I volunteered for it. And here's what I discovered, Alice, that it it was it's way underground. It's completely dark. I mean, there is zero light. And when they lock that door, sensory deprivation immediately kicks in. There's no sound. You can't see any part of your body because it is so pitch black. If you try to put your hand in front of your face, you don't. So you lose all your spatial you know, recognition and all the rest of it. And I was only there for two minutes or however it was. And I was ready getting, to confess. <laughs> yeah, I was getting, you know, and I thought, what if, what if you were locked up like that, you know, for days or weeks, you would confess to anything, you know? Yeah. I mean, so it was a self-fulfilling kind of a, um, a deal that, that would allow or would force women to, to make really what were basically false confessions uh, because there was nothing worse. I mean, death would have been preferable to continue in that situation. Um, you know, the brutality of it was extraordinary. Oh, extraordinary. And, you know, it's funny. I always feel like, especially around this time of year that, you know, so why is it that we're still interested in witches and why is it that little girls still want to dress up as witches? And I always feel like, you know, it is the mythic character, the only female mythic character with power. You know, I mean, you have a choice. It's a princess or a witch. You know, I personally always wanted to dress up as a witch. I would rather have the power and of magic or, you know, and, and I think it still really appeals to girls and women for that reason. And that's, you know, the connection that we have. Wow. You know, it takes me back to the Oz books. Remember, we have Mombi the Bad Witch, but we had Glinda the Good of the North. Glinda was the Good Witch. And, yeah, you know, yeah. it was a kind of a constant power struggle thing going on. Asma had magical powers, but was not a witch. Uh, but these two women um, em employed both the dark and the light side, which, you know, basically they're, they were books written for children. But it's interesting that Baum um, managed to capture the duality of, of magic. It could be used for good or it can be used for evil. Absolutely. But and you're still right. Yeah, but I also feel, you know, well, this book, The Book of Magic, is also about like the very complicated relationships that women have with each other. And especially in a family, whether it's sisters or aunts and nieces or, you know, mothers and daughters. I mean, I'm endlessly fascinated by those relationships and how complex they are. Very complex. Would, it, would, the, would the story be different if one or both of the little orphans that come to live with Jet and Franny had been boys? Well, I don't know because there is a character, Franny and Jet have a brother, Vincent, who is kind of in a way my favorite character and many people's favorite characters. I don't know because the book, Practical Magic was so much about sisterhood. And, you know, for me, I don't, ha I don't have a sister. So it was a way for me to experience what that might be like. But I think for a lot of readers, that was kind of the heart of the book. It, it wasn't just the magic, it was the sisterhood. Excellent point. Um, right. So, you know, if we wanted to sum up, you wrote a beautiful letter in the in this advanced reading copy um, to booksellers. I don't know because it actually says, dear reader, does this also appear in the finished copy? You know, I don't know. I don't think so. No, it's really lovely. I mean, it's a, it's two pages and um, you know, this is clearly a very nostalgic. I say that rather than bittersweet a nostalgic book for you to have written because you are in the end saying goodbye to the whole Owens family. You know, you, you began with practical magic and then you took us to Essex to see the roots of the problem. And now the thrust of this story is, you know, can the curse be broken? Yeah. You know, I've been writing about these characters for 26 or 27 years. It's a long time. I never expected this to happen. But I do feel very attached to them. And interestingly enough, I started the first book um, out in Wellfleet, out on Cape Cod, in, on, writing on a marsh in a little shed. And I finished this book out in Wellfleet, the fourth book. I was in the same place and not the same house, but the similar marsh. And it just felt like a very full circle kind of moment for me to end and have closure with these characters. Yes, indeed. Well, you do say in this letter, so I'm reading Alice's words, that every story begins 
and every story ends. It is yeah. extremely painful for me to say goodbye to a family I know and love. And I may have, here's the good news, I may have to revisit one or two of the characters in the future. But for now, I know that once upon a time, there were two sisters and two aunts and two young women on the brink of their futures and one brother who could not break uh, a heart and mend it. All of them as different from one another as night is from day. They were willing to do anything for love and for one another. And for 25 years, I've been fortunate enough to have them in my life. It's been an honor and a pleasure. You know, that that's such a beautiful thing to write to your characters. Yeah. You know, I really felt that. I really felt like they, I went through, you know, a huge part of my life with them. And for me, it really enriched my life, writing about them and, and knowing them. And, you know, I feel really fortunate. I feel like they just walked in the door and there they were. And I just was very lucky. Well, you've written a lot of other magnificent books too. So um, what is it? I can't imagine that you're putting down your pen. You may be putting the end of this story. <laughs> so what is it that you might be working on now? Well, I'm just, I think I'm finishing. I'm not sure. I never like to say too much because you just never know. Some, I, I have finished books that have like wound up in a drawer. But I am working on something that I really like that takes place um, 500 BCE. So it's a very ancient story and completely different than the Book of Magic, although there's magic in it. Um, so, you know, it was really interesting for me to do a lot of research. Um, and um, I'll see what happens with it. It sounds wonderful. You know, a question that people always ask um, when we have these conversations, when we start talking about books set in the past, is what kind of research do you do? What did you do, for example, what kind of research did you do to go back to Essex 300 years ago? Well, I, I read a lot. You know, it wasn't so easy because there's not that much history about everyday common women. So, you know, whether whether I wanted to find out what food people ate or just kind of things about domestic life, that's always the hardest part for me to, to unearth. Um, so I just, you know, I did what writers do. I just I just read everything I could find about it. And, you know, I made lists. I'm very interested in in kind of creating the world. So I make lists of the trees, of the animals, the birds. I feel like I have to really get to know the place before the characters, you know, can walk into the place. Do you find, I remember Sharon K. Penman, whose books you may know, a wonderful historical writer. And I remember her talking about research into the past. And she said one of the keys to it was specificity. In other words, you don't say they tied the horse to a tree. You say they tied the horse, you know, to a flaming beach or whatever yes. it is, you know. I think that's really true. I think that it so helps to create the world in every aspect and you know in terms of you know the kind of apples somebody's eating you know i think that really makes the world come alive and, and you know for for women's history i mean things like monument rooms where you know where women may have you know kept household records um you know books about what they spent on clothing or what the household spent on food or um or laundry or whatever. I mean, women's voices don't tend to write the big history, but they often are found in domestic details, aren't they? Yes. And I'm really interested in that. I mean, for the Dove Keepers, for instance, it was really difficult to find that sort of material. So one of the things I did was, let's say I wanted to know, like, how would you make cheese, you know? Um, so I looked, I read to see how current nomadic people made cheese. And I just assumed pretty pretty similar to the way it was you know thousands of years ago well that makes sense i mean you know they're they're actually especially with cooking i mean now you know now we're into sous vide and everything i mean i live i live with a man who lives to cook he just loves it and so every time there's some dramatic new thing for food here we go um and and he loves sous vide and how that works but you know most of the time basic cooking is still basic cooking yeah yeah and the same thing as, you know, I want to know how, how people knit, how, how people sew, you know, those details, I think, really matter. They do. Um, I was touring England years ago. Gosh, it was back in the mid 80s or something. I took a sabbatical for my life after I didn't die. 
and out went to England for six months and all by myself. First time I was in my mid forties. It was the first time I'd ever, you know, actually been completely on my own. And my, my goal was to visit every cathedral, which I did. Um, wow. and, and I'm not religious. So it was really about the pageantry and the architecture and other things. But I also visited as many national trust and English heritage homes as I could. Um, and I stayed in as many, um, homes like that, that had been converted into hotels and so forth. So I'm in Yorkshire, which is an absolutely great place to be if you want to do that. And I went out to one of the country houses and I remember that um, there were a number of women as kind of docents and all. And I went around the house and then, because I really love kitchens, I said to them, you know, is there a kitchen I could tour? And they looked very sad and very apologetic. And they said to me, well, we never could get the kitchen right, they said. But they brightened up. They said, we have a laundry. And I thought, oh, hot <laughs> damn, I've never. So, you know, it was like a whole structure and outside. And they had it within it a centuries long accumulation of how people did laundry. There were like 50 different kinds of irons, all the way from little tiny things where they would iron roughs and starch them, you oh. know, to some sort of version of a mangle. Um, it was absolutely fascinating but it was all women's history wasn't it because women did the laundry that's right I, I find it fascinating also it's funny because we started talking about the kitchen and we're back in the kitchen I mean it is sure. it is you know domestic life and it really makes the world you know that and you know it, it, it's so interesting to me because so much of women's history is domestic history and yeah. And so much of it is lost. And I always feel like when I'm writing about the past, I'm trying to give voice to women who really couldn't tell their own stories. And even though the book of magic is set, you know, right now in the, in the present, it's still kind of defined by the past and at kind of every turn, you know, and, and we're living now, but we're so influenced by the things that happened, you know, to our mothers and grandmothers. Absolutely. Um, one of the things I forgot to mention, which I thought was really interesting, doesn't it isn't a spoiler for the book, um, is there are two different cemeteries in this town where Jet and Franny live, and they choose to be buried differently. Why is that? Well, there's two. The Owens have their own cemetery in the town where they where they lived because I think basically they felt like outsiders. There were witches. They weren't supposed to be buried, you know, in the regular, where the regular people were. But um, Jet decides she wants to be buried alongside the first boy that she ever loved. And um, so that's, that's where she is. But, you know, the Owens are funny because they're both outsiders and yet they're very involved with people in the town because um, there's one character who really surprised me who's, who's the uh, father of Jet's first, first love. And he's a reverend who, who was very much against the Owens family. And it really surprised me that they come to have a very intense relationship and a very loving relationship. He becomes part of the family really in, in some ways. So that was a big surprise to me. You know, I always feel like there are surprises when you're writing, when you're writing a novel. And that was a big surprise to me. Well, I thought it was really fascinating because these sisters, they lived together, they were so close in life, and yet in death, they chose, you know, to, um, to be buried differently, um, and didn't choose cremation either, which, you know, is a, another whole thing, but there we well, are. You know, I think in, in this book, all, there's kind of three sets of sisters, and they're all completely different, and completely loyal and dedicated to each other. And I think that's, you know, I think that happens in families where we can be like so different than our siblings and yet connected through, you know, through this, this shared history and this shared past. I do want to say um, that I'm going to ask Sandra to, uh, I'm sorry, not Sandra. I'm looking at the cast there. I want to talk about the movie Practical Magic for a moment, oh, yeah. which Sandra Bullock starred, which is what threw me. Um, but um, I, I want to emphasize that while this is a book about um, people coming to some of the characters, coming to the end of their lives and how they approach that. This is really a beautiful, hopeful, magical, really cheerful life affirming book. I don't want anybody to go away thinking this is a sad book because it's absolutely just the opposite. It's a really joyous book. And good for you, Alice, that you were able to write about this kind of a thing in that way. 
Yeah, thank you. I really wanted to write about it in that way because I think it's kind of an appreciation of life and family and love. It absolutely is. No, that was my dog, not yours. <laughs> I'm looking at my dog. I'm giving her a dirty look. <laughs> no, no, it's the puppy. I can no, hear my dog barking. <laughs> no, she has a very large bark. So um, I did want to ask you about the movie Practical Magic and Patrick, who comes out of the, the dark to tell me it started. Sandra Bullock, Nicole Kidman, Stockard Cheney. What an amazing yes. cast. It was the most amazing cast. I felt so lucky. You know, one of the things that happened was that Sandra Bullock really, um, she was the person that decided to make the movie and she was amazing. And she gathered the cast together and she, you know, knew what she wanted and um, she really made it happen. But it's just an incredible cast of women. And I think you don't see that too often in movies. Even now, it's very rare to see such a, a female centric movie with so many interesting female characters. I think it's happening more often, but at the time that the movie came out, it was very unusual. And, and really a wonderful experience for you. I mean, oftentimes authors are not, not oftentimes. It's a risk for any author to have a book turned into a different storytelling medium on, or on it a is. different platform. Um, and, you know, for, for you to be happy with it is a really wonderful thing. Yeah, I mean, it's different than the book, but you know, it's, it's its own thing. They're both their own things. And I think I love the movie. And I think it's interesting, because every year, it's gotten more popular. And I think it's something that friends and sisters and mothers and daughters all share. And, and, uh, and I'm very happy about that. I think it's great. Has there been any interest in filming the other the next three books? Yes, actually, the the Denise Denovi, who was the producer of Practical Magic has um, the rules of magic and magic lessons and practical magic. And hopefully that will be a, a series of those kind of the, all of those books combined together. Yeah, I, I, are they movies or are you thinking again, because we were talking about long form television, is it more likely to be, you know, a sort of Netflix kind of a thing than a Hollywood kind of a thing? Yes. I think it's much more, I think there's so, it's such a complicated history and there's so many characters right. that I really think, and so many different time periods, I really think, it, I think they plan it as a series. How wonderful for your fans. I love that. All right, Patrick, it's time for me to summon you up using my witch powers out of the dark um, for questions of your own or comments from readers. Hello. Um, let's see, yeah, let, we have some questions. But I just wanted to ask you, Alice, yeah, that that uh, the movie version, of course, has really kept, as you say, it keeps growing new fans and yeah. it sort of has the status of a cult classic, a true cult classic. Yeah, yeah. Um, how were you involved much with the making of it? Or did you consult yeah. or anything? I really wasn't. And they had a couple of different writers. I wasn't. I went out and um Hollywood where they, they they had the stage set of the inside of the house in Hollywood and the outside of the house on Whitby Island off of um, Seattle. And I went to the Hollywood house and I walked into that kitchen and I just thought, this is the kitchen. We're back to kitchens, but I just thought this is the most beautiful kitchen I've ever seen. And Sandra Bullock was so incredibly wonderful and nice. So I didn't have that much to do with it. I just felt like this is theirs. This belongs to them, not me at this point, but um, you know, they were very nice and inclusive. Wow. Uh, it's wonderful that you've had such a positive experience, you know, with, yeah. with what can be sometimes traumatic, but yeah. it's always great for fans. And you know, it is important that fans understand that there is a difference between, you know, storytelling in a book and storytelling yeah. in a visual medium. Yes. Yeah. And also, obviously, you were well established as a writer by that point, but it brought you, a, I'm sure, a whole new audience just from that exposure. I think so. And you know, yeah. it's really interesting because I feel like people are still discovering practical magic, you know, 25 years later. Okay. It's being read by, especially by younger people who, have, who haven't read it before. So that's, that's a lovely feeling. And part of that is due to the movie that, you know, people see the movie and they feel like, okay, so now I want to read the book. Right. Well, it's a book club book, too. Didn't you think it's a book that yeah. really invites discussion? In fact, all of them do. I mean, a great book club project would be to read all four books. Yeah, it'd be fun and take a while. <laughs> that too, but why not? Let's see. So for questions from the audience, you just have a lot, a lot of love coming from your fans. A lot of people oh, just chiming in. And 
saying how much they love the work. best readers, I have to say. Yeah, and how much the books have meant to them. A lot of comments like that. Uh, let's see here. Okay, Sue asks, she says, are the, are the characters still with you after you finished the book? I've heard other authors talk about the character kind of taking over and changing the story or the direction you thought you were going in with your story. Um, not sure how to, how to figure that out, but. Yeah, no, definitely. I always feel that like I have an outline. I think I know where I'm going. And then the characters decide to do something completely different. And it's a big shock to me and a surprise. So, you know, I, I still feel these characters, you know, very warm hearted to these characters. And I think I always will be because I spend so much time with them. Do you recommend, a couple of people have asked about the, uh, the, the, the proper reading order for this quartet. Does it have to, should they be read in sequence that they were published? You know, I think it really doesn't matter. And I think you could read one and not the other ones. But if I was coming to it, I think I'd want to start with Magic Lessons, which is the original story of Maria Owens. I think I might want to do it in time and then read the rules of magic, practical magic, and then the book of magic. But it depends. You could all, you could go front forwards in time or backwards in time. It, it kind of depends on how you would like the story to unfold. And let's say that, you know, the sequence of the books as published also reflects the story as it developed in Alice. That's because, true. I mean, she could have written the first book, you know, the, the 300 years ago book first, if, if right. the story had come to you that way, but it didn't. No, it didn't. Um, let's see. Uh, Tara or Tara, forgive me if I'm picking the wrong one has a couple of really nice comments. She says, I cried and cried and cried when I read The Rules of Magic. I love all the books, but it was just so stunningly gorgeous. And then she goes on She goes on to say, I feel like Jet and her relationship with the Reverend, but is this gonna be a spoiler? Uh, was set up at the end of The Rules of Magic. He could at least tolerate her. Yeah. Yeah, it really changes. I, you know, I have to say, I, I myself didn't know what was going to happen between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And it just unfolded while I was writing the book of magic, because I think I, you know, I think a lot about forgiveness, as I think a lot of people do. And I think it's a great gift to be able to forgive. Um, it, it's kind of a gift to yourself, really, to be able to forgive. And that's something Jet is able to do. But thank you, Tara, or Tara, that I, I, I appreciate that. Let's see. Um, ba, 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 ba. The rules of magic, says Jenny, made me ugly cry. <laughs> There's some kind of emoji. <laughs> um, there are a lot of nice comments like that. Uh, so nice. You can really tell how much your books mean to your fans. Um, let's see here. Uh, Mac Lynn says, Alice Hoffman is a genuinely special author. So certainly there would be a terrific amount of warm regard flitting through these comments. Simply put, Alice is inspiring. Very kind uh, to give up her time and very kind of poison pen. Thank you. To always organize such wonderful events. So oh, that is I agree nice. with her about poison pen. Thank you very much. But is her name Macklin? Is that her name? Mac and then Lynn. Two yeah. words. It's so funny. I had a very dear friend named Macklin. And so I immediately feel very close to this person. So thank you very much for the comment. That is a uh, lovely comment. I want you to know we went the last mile. I was telling Alice, I am actually wearing witch earrings. I don't know if you can see them all <laughs> that clearly, but I thought, um, there we go. I thought that it would really be fun to, um, to bring these out. I've had them, Alice. I'll bet I've had these earrings for 40 years, and I get to <laughs> wear them for like two weeks a year, you know, right around <laughs> Halloween. Um, I have a I have a Christmas purse that I only carry in December because I'm afraid it will disintegrate. Uh, but <laughs> every December, it's a it's kind of a way of marking, you know, um, a special holiday or something to have something like that, and you you bring it out and then you enjoy it and then you put it away. Yeah, it's nice. Do you find yourself doing that? You know, I I, I don't really celebrate holidays very much. I have to say. I mean, my favorite is probably Halloween because I love fall. I love autumn. That's my favorite time of the year. I love October. So I, I'll, I would do pretty much anything to celebrate in October. It is a wonderful season. I grew up in Chicago and I'm here to tell you that October was the really always the best month of the year for mm -hmm. weather and for color and all the rest of it. Um, it you know, was a 
fairly brutal climate, but October was always magical. And you're in, you're in New England, right? I'm in New England. It's beautiful. So, and truly magical. Has the pandemic slowed down the tree tourists? You know, I don't think so. I, you know, I just was out in Concord today and there were busloads of people coming to look at trees and other things, but mostly trees, I think. Yeah. Well, of course, the maple is so extraordinary um, in terms of the colors then, and it's rampant in New England. Also, interestingly enough, in Japan, I was really shocked when we were in Japan to realize that the Japanese maple is almost as dramatic as the New England maple for color. Yeah. Yeah, who knew? You know, I mean, the more you travel, I think it was because I grew up reading the Oz books where, you know, the geography is defined by color. So if you're, it's blue and munchkin land and, you know, purple and in, in the north and, you know, the Emerald City and the whole bit. And so I, I grew up with an expectation that places that I, what I would travel would be like that. They'd be and, a and color. I'm now yeah. the whole globe and both Arctics and the whole bit. And I realized that it's actually all looks the same. Most of the time, the Yangtze River Valley really looks like the highlands of Scotland, for example. I mean, it's the same kind of, you know, rippling in Japan looks like that too, the whole bit. And it's been, I never quite get over the fact that I expect it to be like green and then yellow and then red. Well, I have to say in, in the Book of Magic, there's a lot of traveling and they go to a lot of my favorite places. So that was really fun for me to have, especially during COVID when I couldn't travel to be to be working on this project where, where people could travel to all my favorite places. Well, that's really a bonus. So if there are no more questions, let me point out that um, there are two extra wonderful things about um, the Book of Magic for you readers. One is Alice's list of books that you can read. And Alice, I recognize that I have not read all of them, so you have inspired me. Um, I've decided to make a project reading Alice's list. That's going to be, no, I'm serious, a project for me. I have never read Fahrenheit 451. Oh, really? I have not. I oh, mean, I'm admitting wow. it right here in public. How can I possibly I not have read Fahrenheit no. 451? Well, good. I'm glad. I'm glad that I'm, I'm introducing you to it, to read it, because I have to say, I think it's just really a work of genius. And I think, I mean, I love Ray Bradbury, but it, that book is very meaningful, you know, to this day. And, it, you know, it's about a society where books are considered dangerous and books are burned. And um, there are firemen who don't put out fires. They, they burn books. So it's really, it's really a very important book. I think you'll love it. I'm sure I will. I'm, I've always hated Savonarola, for example. I mean, you know, book burning in Florence, who needed it? So kind of the same thing. And the other thing is that there are, about the travel, we're going to come back as we started, uh, libraries, which are really wonderful, kitchens and food. It's wonderful and very comforting to read about those things and think libraries feed the mind, food nourishes the body. Um, you know, um, it's just a wonderful book. It's really magical, Alice. Thank you so yeah. much for the gift of these four books. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me here. I'd love to, I'd love to come and talk to you. Oh, oh, thank you. Quick question that I wouldn't oh, mind sure. sneaking in, which is, uh, Alice, can you, can you speak for a moment about your, uh, your books for young readers, like The Green Witch and some of the other books? Good point. Yeah. yeah, I have written uh, quite a few books for young readers. And, you know, I think the reason I did that, especially for like teen readers, is because I always feel like what you read at 12 and 13 and 14 influence you so deeply, like no other literature you ever read. That's the time that I read Ray Bradbury. And he really kind of changed my life as a, as a reader, as a person, as a writer. So I wrote um, two fun books called Aquamarine and Indigo. Aquamarine was a movie as well um, about mermaids. Um, and then I wrote a series, um, uh, it started with Green Angel and then Green Witch that I wrote after 9-11. Um, and really when I felt like I couldn't write and it's about a, a girl who's very traumatized and she writes her way back to life. And um, so I have had a great response from readers and, and, you know, I feel like teen readers go on to read adult books and it's kind of like an entree into becoming a reader, which I think is so important. And thankfully, you know, I, I feel like teens are reading more than ever. And, um, uh, you know, it, I just feel like it's, it's really, for me, really fun to, to write those books. You know, you're totally right. Um, we have, a, for years, had a um, shelf for teen readers. 
I mean, a shelf and hardly anything ever moved on. And once we got into COVID, it's extraordinary. I mean, especially on the weekends, we might sell, you know, it doesn't seem like a lot, but compared to none, it's huge. Um, you know, we might sell 15 or 20 titles. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I know that's a small thing overall, but at the same time, I think it really shows um, a much elevated you know, experience, um, reading experience. We could hope that the pandemic having paused life in some ways has brought more people back to books. Well, I think a lot of adults are going back and reading YA stuff too. I've noticed yeah, that. Yeah. I think it's kind of a thin line between what's YA reading and what's adult reading. Right. Well, your, your friend Mac Lynn uh, has appeared again and, uh, and she says, don't forget the ice queen. And, uh, and then she, she also mentioned how much she enjoyed the book Faithful um, oh, a couple of years ago. Thank you. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, both of those books, you know, I feel like it, it's kind of a part of your life when you're writing those books. And um, thank you, Macklin. Alice has an extraordinary bibliography. Um, and, you know, it's, it's wonderful because readers of all kinds can dive into her books. You know, there's no typecasting here. Um, and we're just delighted that, um, that we have them. So thank you all very much for joining us this evening, Alice. It's such a pleasure. I, I hope we could do this live again sometime. Oh, I hope so too. I hope I see Wonderful. So. I really thank Alice for over the years. She's been so wonderful about accepting shipments and autographing books for us. So I'll remind you that we do have autograph copies coming. And Patrick said, because of the weight, um, for the book, which has uh, been slightly delayed from its original publication date. We have some extra swag uh, from uh -huh. Alice, uh, which includes chocolate and a key that Patrick was dangling. Chocolate um, is awesome and very special. Yeah, no, it's, it's really very cool. So um, don't delay ordering because we don't have an unlimited supply of all of this. Anyway, um, there'll be a podcast available, so you can recommend that to friends, and the video is going to live forever on our Facebook. And now, on our YouTube site, because we recognized when Facebook went down last Monday that we need to be uh, including YouTube from now on. So we're not totally at the mercy of Mark Zuckerberg and his happy hand of whatever they are, right? So um, do tell your friends about it. And um, thank you for joining us. Good night, Alice. Thank you. Good night, Patrick. Thank you Good once night. again for your wonderful Thanks. tech. You bet. Thanks everybody for tuning in too. Where did they all go?